his his rise to power was maybe in some ways non-traditional uh maybe it was a bit more common it, it's non-traditional to the way that many young people are sort of in the west especially accustomed to seeing leaders come to power um Sankara was in prison for a little bit yes and then the coup of 1983 happened um could you just and then and then after that Sankara becomes the leader of yes which he then renames Burkina Faso, which stands Absolutely. for the land of upright men. Um, could right. you just go a little bit more into depth of that whole situation? Yes, absolutely. So when he comes back to uh, uh, Upper Volta, it was still Upper Volta from Madagascar. At that time, the country was already ruled by a military leader who had uh, deposed the, you know, when the French left most of their colonies, just like the British, to identify some Africans who would, you know, wear the suit and tie and essentially continue the work <laughs> of the colonial regime in Africa. So that was the case also in uh, Upper Malta. But then the military was obviously the most powerful institution in most of these countries where the colonial regime never developed strong institutions because they never had any plans of leaving. So you don't have like a strong judiciary, you know, you don't have a strong political structure, right? Uh, so you only have the military. So the military really in most of those countries exercised the true power, you know? So you had a military ruler by that time, but a military ruler who did not have the kind of consciousness that Thomas Sankara had. So when Thomas Sankara comes back he is given the command of one of the major military training academies. And that's where he starts, you know, radicalizing other young officers. And he starts giving them a different vision of their country. So the military regime that was there, also, of course, they're aware that this is a very, a very smart individual. And there was a brief war between uh, Upper Volta and Mali at that time. And he was identified as somebody who had great military leadership skills too, because he performed very well during that conflict, which was uh, resolved diplomatically at some point. So at some point, he is actually brought into, into, into the system, into the government. And at some point, he becomes a um, minister of um, minister of information, but he's a very unique minister of information. He rides a bike to go to work when all these other ministers and top government officials have these, you know, Mercedes and all these ostentatious uh, display. And he starts setting this very different agenda that we in government should be in the service of the people. So he he's like completely stands out, right? And then he tells the journalists who work for the government media outlets that he is in charge of now, because they all report to him as minister. He says, you can actually be real journalists. So if you find government officials engaging in corruption, I want you to write about it. I want you to report it on TV. I want you to talk about it on the radio. <laughs> and of course, you know, that's what journalists like doing. And they didn't believe him initially, but when they see that he's serious, they start doing it. Right. So even though he is serving in that same government, his fellow ministers are now reading about their involvement in shady deals and corruption. <laughs> Right. right. So obviously, he's not a favorite of corrupt ministers. Right. Right. And he had a deadline for himself. He said, I would serve, I forget, I think it was a year or a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And that at that point, I'm going to resign. Right. And he resigns after he attended a meeting with, you know, the president. And he said, you know, the yeah. deadline is here. So I'm resigning. So obviously they punish him for that. They don't like that. First of all, you're upstaging the president. And by that time, France was also 
you know, putting a lot of pressure. So he's, you know, he's out and he's kind of restricted for a while, his movements. Um, another government's come into place and they realize that, listen, this guy is actually a great asset. So he's brought back again as prime minister. And he goes back to the same thing he was doing, you know, clean, efficient government, fighting and denouncing corruption. But then he starts talking about the need for Upper Volta to become independent and not to be that dependent on France and other countries. And once again, France does not like that. So he is forced out of government. And even before that, when they went to places, the prime minister with the president, who of course was his boss, right. he would get the most applause. And sometimes if he spoke first to warm up, you know, and then introduce the president, after he sat down, people would start leaving. You see, so they <laughs> saw this guy as a danger to yeah. the establishment, even though a great boon really to the people of Upper Volta. So once again, France demands that this guy be removed from the government and the neo-colonial uh, government in, uh, in uh, Upper Volta. They carry out the master's uh, instructions and they forced him out and he's arrested and young, some other young officers whom they knew were close to him are also arrested. But that really backfires because then it sparks really a, uh, a coup to rescue him. And the, the young officers that uh, took over and launched the coup, they say, hey, you are our natural leader. And that's when he really embarks on that great experiment that he undertook from 1983 until 1987 when he was eliminated in Burkina Faso.